Hey, Fairview, welcome back for another online service. It's me, Paul, back with you. Glad you could join us today for our online weekend service. Now, when it comes to the church website, you can see it down below on the screen here, fairviewccc.org, fairviewccc.org. If you want to join us for our weekly Bible study on Wednesdays, that's starting here in September, so we'd love to have you. It's going to be... Um, info at fairviewccc.org. Email us at info at fairviewccc.org. If you want to find us on Facebook, just search up Fairview Community Christian Church on Facebook and you'll find us. Now to YouTube. When it comes to this little red button down below that says subscribe, if you'll click on that, you'll go ahead and be a part of the people that get notified about the videos. Click the bell and it'll like let you know every time we post the weekend services. Sometimes they're Friday night, sometimes they're Saturday night, sometimes they're Saturday morning, but we try to post them each week for you and have been doing so since the COVID started. I got the COVID. I got the COVID. All right. COVID, COVID. Oh, baby, let my people go. You know, we were just a little ahead of our time when we were singing Pharaoh. We could, we could do something with that. All right. Hey, uh, if you are uh, one of those faithful givers to our church, thank you. If you're once in a while a giver for our, to our church financially, thank you so much. Uh, you guys can give through PayPal. You can mail your gift here to the church, or you could just bring it with you on a Sunday when we see you. And if we haven't seen you for a while, we miss you. We'd love to see you. You know, I was counting the attendance recently, and quite frankly, it's uh, actually up. So there's plenty of people coming out, and uh, but there's some folks, and I don't want to name you on camera, but... Um, and it's not because I want to shame you. I just miss seeing you. I miss talking to you on a Sunday morning. We miss you. And we'd love to connect with you. So with that said, let's say a word of prayer. And then we're going to sing this morning's songs. Because he lives in the key of D, trade my sorrows, and then give thanks. Let's say a word of prayer this morning. Lord, in you we live and we move and we have our being. And you've told us that you want us to give thanks to you in all things. So we do, Lord. In sickness and health, Lord, thank you that you're with us. And times are good when times are bad. Thank you that you are with us. Lord, you are faithful in spite of what circumstances might tell us, in spite of what our surroundings might tell us, Lord. We just look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord, that you're going to keep writing our faith today. You're going to keep writing that story of faith in our lives today. And all we got to do is walk with you, hold on to you, and trust in you, Lord. And you're going to see it through. You're going to see this fully restored being this fully restored human being that's been forgiven, that's been set free, and we can all walk with you because of the work of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, because he lives. And God sent his son, they called him Jesus. Oh, 
holds the future. Life is worth the living just because it's worth the living just because it is worth the living just because he did. love that one. I think I heard that one back in Bible college at the age of 20, 21 years old. And uh, then again, my pastor in Paradise, California, Robert L. Stevens. He's in Blue-Eyed, Blue-Eyed, Missouri, I think. That's where he's at right now. And he used to play that one all the time. And I know it goes a lot slower, but I'd like to Johnny Cash that one up. But I just love the message of that song. All right, trade my sorrows and give thanks. every single day what we're going to do. We're going to walk with him or not. We can say, Lord, I may not be feeling it. My wife likes to say, you got to dig down deep sometimes in life. And I would say when it comes to our faith, we got to hold on. Hold on to the Lord and just walk with him in spite of your circumstances. Like Job said, you know what? Though he slay me, I trust him. And there's that old line I heard in many a sermon, when you can't track him, you can trust him. 
All right, finally, we're going to go ahead and do give thanks. He's given Jesus Christ His Son Give thanks With a grateful heart Give thanks To the Holy One Give thanks Because He's given Jesus Christ His Son And now Let the weak say thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. You are a good, good Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. Now, you might want to either underline that or put something around it because that's significant on what's going to happen in the future here. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel. And he told them, go up and spy out the land, the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it and do not wear, uh, weary the whole army. For only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Now, if you go back just a little bit, you're going to find that so far the, the traveling that the children of Israel has done is, has been pretty much a cakewalk. I mean, they haven't had to fight any, any armies. They haven't had to go up against any, any particular individuals. They've been wandering around in the desert for about 40 years, and the people of Israel are now finally being allowed to go into the promised land. 
And their arrival is accompanied by a miracle after a miracle after a miracle. And we're not, we're not talking about little piddly miracles here. We're talking about the great big whopping miracles that God provided while they were out in the desert. But then they run into an obstacle as they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They have to cross the Jordan River. Now, during the dry months, the Jordan River isn't really much of a challenge at all. Uh, I've been there. I've stood on the banks of the Jordan River, and I was there about late springtime. In late springtime, the water was running pretty good because it's, it's a snow melt, and uh, it was uh, rather deep and rather swift. But still, we're not talking about the Mississippi River, or we're not talking about the Sacramento River. And fact is, if you can go back and forth on that, uh, on that particular river, you will find in the dry period places where you can actually walk across the river. But from the report that we just got, it would appear that the crossing didn't happen during the dry months. Instead, the normally gentle Jordan is now a major obstacle. It is at flood stage. And so God gives this instruction to Joshua, and then Joshua gives the instruction to the people. And he tells them, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to simply follow the priest. Trust them, he said. They will show you the way to get across the river. Then Joshua goes and tells the priest, I want you to pick out 12 members, one from each tribe. They're going to represent the tribe. They're going to go along with you. And in this way, he says, we will be led into the promised land by the promise of God himself. And I'm sure at that point that those 12 that were supposed to go across this very swollen, rapid flood stage river kind of got together and they said, uh, wait, wait, wait. Are you telling us at least where the bridge is going to be? Or maybe telling us where some big rocks are going to be so that we can kind of walk across this thing? And so Joshua, being the encourager that he says, that he is rather, he says, no problem. When you get to the edge of the river, you just wade in and everything will take care of itself. No, it, it really will. God told me that as soon as you step into the river, he will cut off the upstream, he will pile it up like a heap, and you can walk on dry land. <laughs> okay, let me see if I got this right. We step into the river, right? Yep. God cuts off the flow upstream, right? Yep. Piles up the river like a heap, right? You got it. And we cross this flooded river on dry land. Yep. That's basically it, Joshua told him. At this point, I think the 12 called a board meeting. <laughs> like, all, like all good groups would, you know? And they got this board meeting, and they put their heads together, and then they finally come out and they say, Joshua, what's your other plan? You do have another plan, don't you? They're carrying a box, you got to understand, with a whole lot of stuff in it, you know, and including in that box, you're going to have two stone tablets. That's kind of heavy. And Joshua wants them to go, you know, to go whitewater rafting and not providing any raft. But he said, uh, we don't need another plan. See, this is God's plan. And God will work it out. Well, they come to the Jordan. The priest sticks their little toes in the water, and then they start wading right in, and you know what happens? The river stops. I mean, it just stops. It's as if God put his hand down, which he did, and dammed up the whole river. The priests walk across on dry land, and then they're, they're followed by thousands and thousands of individuals. I mean, the Israelites were a big group of people by then. Thousands of people, the Israelites, go across the river. Now, if you don't think that's amazing, then you don't have an imagination or you can't really see what's going on. That is absolutely incredible. Now, when they get across the river, they got another stop. It's called Jericho. You ever hear the song? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jerry. What are you laughing at? That's a good song, right? It's about 100 years old, but that's a good song, okay? And they look at the city and they go, you know what? We don't have a chance. We don't have a chance. I mean, realistically, think about it. Regardless of how many Israelites there were, after wandering around in the desert for 40 years, they were no army. The only thing that they were good at is walking, which is going to come into play very shortly. They were basically nomads. Spent the last 40 years surviving in a desert that they had no business being in to start with. And sure, there were a lot of them, and that, that's probably threatening in itself, but Jericho is huge. 
It's a fortified city. They got big walls and big gates and lots of guards. They got the whole package. So what's the plan, Joshua? God instructs Joshua. Joshua gives the instruction to the people. This is what he told them. I want seven priests to walk in front of the Ark of the Covenant playing ram's horns. And I'm sure they're going, yeah. Yeah, I can see it. The rest of the people are going to follow, but you're going to follow quietly. Yeah, we're going to sneak up on him. You know, don't shout. Don't sing. Don't speak. We're going to march around this city once, and then we're going to come back to the camp. And I'm sure somebody in the back put up their hand and said, is that the entire plan? And Joshua goes, no. And he goes, oh, good. For a minute, I thought this whole thing was nuts, all right? Joshua said, well, we're going to do this for six days. Yes. Then on the seventh day, we're going to march around that city seven times. A lot of walking, but we can do it. And we're going to go around seven times. And on the seventh time around, there will be one long blast from the horns. <laughs> then we're going to start the war. And he said, then I want everybody to shout. And then, then the walls will come tumbling down. It, you got another plan, Joshua? That just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. To which Joshua said, there is no other plan. That's what we got to do. Well, you know what? They've come through the last 40 years. They've had one miracle after another. This stuff worked in the past. Why not give it a shot in the present? And so they did. And guess what? On the seventh day of the seventh trip around the temple, when seven priests blew on the seven horns, guess what happened? The walls came tumbling down. Joshua didn't have another plan, but he didn't need another plan because this was God's plan. And you just have to follow what God has said. In the 1950s, there was a British archaeologist named Kathleen Kenyon. She was doing a study of Jericho, and she really didn't, well, she just wasn't convinced that the biblical account was actually true. But she discovered that the city had suffered a very quick devastation. It wasn't a case of simply a city falling into disarray. Devastation, yes, but um, falling into ruin? No. Grain had been left in storage bins, like they were getting ready to eat that afternoon. The city had been devastated by fire, and it seems as though the fire took the whole place all at one time. And if you read the account, you'll discover that everything was to be destroyed except the precious metal. And we also read in the Bible that it says all the ruins are to be torched. In the biblical account, though, we read that there's one section of wall that didn't fall. And it's where a prostitute lived, of all people. Prostitute Rahab's house. You see, when Joshua sent spies into Jericho earlier, Rahab hid from them I hid those individuals from the authorities. And as a result, she was guaranteed, along with her family, safety. When the archaeologists did a more complete study of the city, they discovered that not all of the walls had totally collapsed. There was a small section on the northern edge of that city that seemed to remain intact, along with the house that was built in the side of the wall. Hmm... Doesn't it make you just wonder? Now, there are several reasons why Jericho was to be taken and destroyed. And if you look on a map, you're going to be able to see where the Israelites had wandered from the past 40 years. So here's the first map. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the map of the mall, doesn't it? Yeah, you are standing here and you're trying to find these other, these other kind of places, all right? And that's kind of the way the Israelites felt as they were going through the promised land, or going through the wilderness. But then you're going to see a second map. And in the second map, you're going to see how Jericho stood at the very gateway to Canaan. So go ahead and flip that. Now, if you'll see the sea over there all the way to the right, and then you go on up farther, and you'll be able to see, maybe I can see it on this side for me. Uh, let's see here. Yes, all the way up where it says Salt Sea, and then above that, almost at the very top, is Jer uh, Jericho. And by the way, if you look a little bit above that very top, you'll see a place called Ai. So it was, it was way up there, all right? Now, and Canaan, as you look at that land, Canaan was not like the good old USA, in the sense of an independent, sovereign nation. 
and said it was this vast territory that was ruled by many different warring groups. Jericho happened to be governed by the strongest faction in the whole area. And so there's a certain psychological benefit to Israel to not only take this fortified city first, but in actually destroying it. Because when they did that, it sends a very clear message to any of the other people who want a war against them. All right? So the walls came down. They took the city. Then they have the next step. Now they go to that city of Ai at the very top of the map. And if you looked at that, you're going to find it's not very far away, a little north, a little west. This time, though, the plan was fairly simple. It, was, it wasn't like the big city of Jericho. This is basically just a little small town. And the spies who had gone ahead checked it out, and they were quite confident that Israel didn't need to send as many people. So Joshua was told, just send 3,000 troops, take the city of Ai. And what happened? They got trounced, thoroughly crushed like a bad 49er game. <laughs> the Bible says they were soundly defeated. So what happened? Well, let me take a minute just to kind of put you in perspective of where we're at. We're, we're in the Bible here in the sixth book of the Bible. So if you go back to Genesis and you count up the books, you're in the sixth book, the book of Joshua. Tradition says that Joshua wrote the book at least most of it. Eliezer probably also wrote some. He was the high priest. And you'll recall from the previous four books that, that we've looked at that Joshua functioned most of the time as Moses' second in command. But then when Moses died, then he accepted the role of a leader of Israel. The book was probably written around 1390 B.C. Why was it written? To continue the history of Israel. We need to see what God has been doing in this country and to show that they owed their very existence to the God of all creation. Okay, now back to the story. Why did the Israelites get thrashed at Ai? The answer lies in the first verse that we read a minute ago out of Joshua 7 verse 1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, and it gives his background, he took some of those. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. After God gave Joshua instructions on what to do with Jericho once it was defeated, he forwarded those instructions to the people of Israel. And this is what he said in Joshua 6, starting with verse 17. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things. He's talking about the things that were devoted to the idols. All these gold and silver and all these kinds. You stay away from those, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord, and they must go into his treasury. He'll take care of them. I don't know. Did anybody ever see Teddy, our dog? A little white dog, you know, about like this, right? One of the commands that Calf taught Teddy when, when we first got him was this. Leave it. Little puppy running around, you know, Leave it. Pretty soon he started leaving it. All right. He was taught some things you can play with, some things you can't. And so when it came to socks and shoes, leave it. When it came to rabbits, my wife would say, leave it. I'd say, go get them. All right. But, <laughs> but that's okay. But he's been pretty good about this over the past. But there are still times that we have to command him because he just kind of forgets. You know, so, hey, Teddy, leave it. That was the command that God delivered to the children of Israel. They were not to loot the city for their own gain. What wasn't presented to the Lord's treasury, the Bible says, was to be destroyed. Now, I don't want to take our modern-day values and try to plug them into something that happened 3,400 years ago. We find out today that that's exactly what's going on with a lot of our nation. 
They're taking things that happened hundreds of years ago and they're trying to put it in, not in cultural, but they're trying to say just the idea of it was wrong. We get it. The idea was wrong. Culturally, it was a different place. They'd make it right, but it was a different place. And the people of Israel were promised Canaan. They took it under God's direction. And I might not understand that. I might not agree with how it happened, but that's the way it was. The Israelites had been instructed on what they could do and what they couldn't do. Somebody messed up the whole plan. When the people were confronted, and he, they did this very deliberately, just one person after another, they're confronted with a reason for the defeat, Achan fesses up in Joshua 7, starting with verse 20. Achan replied, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. That is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, that's about five pounds, a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, that's a little over about a pound and a half. I coveted them and I took them. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Okay, so we find that the guy did something wrong. What do we learn? What, what, what can you take home with you and say, ah, I get it, I get it. Here's the first thing. If you sin, you're going to get caught. Okay? You're going to get caught. See, we, we've been guilty of thinking, well, it's all right if I do this because, see, nobody knows. Nobody knows. And I'm here to tell you today, somebody will find out. Somebody will. Moses wrote in the book of Numbers, uh, 32nd chapter, but if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord and you may be sure that your sins will find you out. You may be sure, not possibly, you may be sure that your sins will find you out. I've been pastoring for over 40 years now and one thing I have discovered is that sin gets uncovered. Sinners like you and me get uncovered and we get discovered. It may not happen right away. But it'll happen. Do you realize we do live in a very small world? And our world just keeps getting smaller and smaller. Somebody's going to know. So you need to understand that. Second thing we can learn is your sin is going to affect others. See, in 2020, we tend to be mm, individualistic, all right? It's tough to, to understand why all of the Israelites, and this is what happened, were punished because one person sinned. I mean, when we think of one person messing up, then one person ought to pay the price, right? Nobody else should have to pay it. But the covenant that God had made was not made with one person. That covenant was made with people, the people of Israel. If one person did something wrong, all of the people suffered. And you and I need to understand, even today, sin doesn't just affect a person who committed it. It goes farther than that. A number of years ago, a pastor was pastoring in a church, and he decided hey, he'd rather spend the rest of his life with the piano player rather than his wife. And by the way, just so you know, we call that adultery. He left his wife. He left his four children. His girlfriend left her husband, left their three children. Common enough in our day and age, right? Happens all the time. 50% of marriages go down the tubes. So it's happening all the time. But that means immediately there were seven other people whose lives were shattered by the decision of these individuals. And within a year of his leaving his wife and moving in with his girlfriend, his oldest daughter, a teenager, was pregnant, and his second oldest daughter had left her husband and was pregnant by another man. And why not? Their moral compass had been shattered. What do we believe in? What should we do? The church that he had been pastoring went from a Sunday morning of attendance of 230 down to 130. Some of those people who came to Christ under his ministry never ever went back to church. The name of the church and Christ was dragged through the mud because of his sin. Our sin affects a lot of people. Obviously, that pastor never paid attention to James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And by the way, that verse frightens me to death. 
to know that I'm going to be held accountable more than anybody else as a teacher. Makes you lie awake at night just wondering if you've said the right things or if you've done the right things. But there's a third thing in this whole thing that we can learn. There's a price that has to be paid. Here it is. I said it before. You'll probably hear me say it again in the future. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go. It will always keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will always cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin does. If you read the account in Achan's world, it cost him his life. They took him out and they stoned him for what he did. In some people's cases, it might cost them their marriage, their job, their friends, their security. But if you continue to continue to sin and rebel against God, here's the hardest part. It'll cost you your eternity. Your eternity. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. One writer wrote, sins cannot be undone, only forgiven. Only forgiven. Romans 6.23, though, has a little bit longer passage than just the first part. Sometimes we forget to read the last part. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that word, but. Everything looks horrible, but. This is what Jesus has done. The Bible also says in 1 John 1, 9, if you and I will confess the sins, take them to the Lord. He's faithful. He's righteous to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And in Ephesians 1, 7, in him who is Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. I repeat, sin cannot be undone. You've sinned, I've sinned. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That part can't be undone. We've done a wrong. But through the forgiveness of the blood of Jesus Christ, it can be totally taken care of. He paid that price for you and for me. So we learn a lot from Joshua. <laughs> we learn that people aren't always going to be happy about your plans, even though you really believe they're from the Lord. Uh, we also learn that there are times when um, it looks as though the whole world is going to fall apart, but we need to understand God's not left us. He's still there. He's walking with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to be our God. We've learned that the sin that we've done really doesn't stay just within the little confines. It pushes itself out farther and farther and farther. So the quicker we deal with that sin, the quicker that ripple stops. We also learn that because of our sin, we should be excluded from the presence of God forever. And that would be true if it was not for what Jesus has done. That he died for us to bring us back into what the Bible calls fellowship. Bring us back into being the righteous child of God. I got some good news for you. It doesn't make any difference if you have the Jordan River that's sitting out in front of you. It doesn't make any difference if it looks like it's something that you could never overcome. God is bigger than all that. And he is saying, you trust me. We'll cross that Jordan. I'll dry up that creek like it's dry ground. But you've got to stick your toes in first. You have to trust that I'll do what I say.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are people here today that, that I know that struggle with some things that are going on in their lives. Maybe, maybe they haven't forgiven themselves. Maybe they're blaming other people. I, I, I don't know what's going on in their minds, but I do know this, that you want us to trust in you. That, that you want us to proclaim that through the blood of Christ I am forgiven and all those bad things that I've done in my life, all those wrong things I've done are all taken care of. Father, we need to live above those circumstances. We need to understand that our sin has caused ripples, but we want to, uh, to live a life now that will calm a lot of that down. And then to live the kind of life where people can see even though I may have not have trusted before, I trust now in what Jesus has done and what he will do. You're an awesome God. You have done some awesome things. Father, when we look at the history of the Israelites, I am just absolutely amazed. You didn't throw up your hands and say, that's enough. But rather you said, no, they're my children, they're my people. And I'll hang in there with them. And through Jesus, you've done the same thing with us. Help us to be people of your word. Help us to be people of righteousness in your eyes through what Jesus has done for us. And help us have the strength to say, this is how myself and my household is going to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. We're going to be going to Judges. I'm going to deal with two very controversial issues next week. One of those is going to be abortion, and the other one is going to be divorce. And so I want you to come and see what we have to say about that and what God's Word has to say, uh, because I want people to know this more than anything. Whatever you've done, God can forgive. People forget that. You know, Christians forget that. Christians, you know, kind of wave this 80-pound Bible and, you know, whack people in the head with it and stuff. And we want God's word. But what we want more than anything is to know that God can handle all of this and he can provide forgiveness. Take that with you, would you? Maybe read the book of Judges. Oh, maybe you ought to pray about the next judge that's coming up in our country. God bless you. We'll see you next week.